Hello, my name's Charles. I'm 54. Yeah. I love Jesus all over again. Yeah. <laughs> ben, are you? Hi, my name's Ben. I also love Jesus. I'm not 54. Um, and uh, this is this is a good volume to talk at, Josh. Yes or no? Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. What is going on? There we go. Thumbs up for Josh. <laughs> Good banter. Good banter is right. We're good to go. Right, so <coughs> today on Accessory to Thoughts, we have another wonderful guest called Carl Blackwood. Blackwell. Yeah. Black. Well. Sorry, Blackwell. Yeah, I told you that earlier, really, mate. No, no, like, I've, I've written it down Blackwell. So at least I knew. I'll cut that out. Right. <laughs> yeah, at okay. least you got it right. <laughs> Black, Carl Blackwell. He's a friend from uh, work, he's a joiner. He's a very interesting man. So we're going to chat with him so you get all the good stories out of him. Oh, yes. Get all the, the good stuff. And then we're going to ditch him. Okay, so... Get all the good stuff. We'll see what sort of stuff there is. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to start with the most important question. Carl, what's your favourite colour? My favourite colour would be red. And yeah. Why red? Red because... Uh, red to me is a warm colour. But it's also a colour because it represents fire. Fire is like a cleansing. And I enjoy I enjoy I enjoy reds for the simple reason is because a lot of things I've had in my life have been red, like yours and and just different things I've had, like, you know. I've just I just enjoy that colour. Yeah, you'll do fine here. <laughs> so what is actually was important, what we ask all everyone comes in here, do you like the painting? The painting. Yeah, it's very nice, yeah. That's correct, Dan. Woo! Right. You get to continue on with That's the rest okay. of the podcast. So, uh, let's just kick it off. Um, so, you're of the Christian, yes? Yes, I am a Christian. Christian since I was 18. Yeah. So, so uh, I did I did backslides. Uh, uh, I backslid when I was about, about four or five years into my faith. I got knocked, uh, rattled a wee bit by different people. And I seem to fall back into the same thing, but not in the same, not not in the same extent as what it was. I was I knew God had a hold of me. I knew God there was always pulling the strings, and He would only let me go so far. And everything I was doing, I was always conscious about it. But you still wanted to delve into things which you knew weren't right, but you didn't delve in fully. Right. But, but you're always on the edge, you know. Right, so um, take us through your upbringing. What was that like? My upbringing was uh, I grew up in a house full of women. Uh, I grew up with my mother, my aunt, my sister and my grandmother. And my father wasn't there. He had left when I was 13. Uh, so I grew up uh, knowing nothing else but sort of female company all the time. And I actually... Uh, my mother raised my daughter, sorry, my mother raised my sister and I, and she done a very good job, I believe. Uh, some people may differ, I don't know. But, uh, no, I grew up there with no nothing else but female company, like, you know. Yeah. You know, and I, I just, right, while I was growing up, was it, I didn't have that, that male stature in my household there was to show me uh, just how things should be in a man's world. Yeah, you know, as in the way of, uh, you know, being strong, being macho, and sticking up for yourself and different things. So then I ended up going through a process of being bullied mm -hmm. there at school, and uh, didn't know how to actually deal with life. You know, like life was such a way where uh, I thought it was meant to be that you're meant to have a girlfriend or a wife. Like that's all I ever knew. There was a the female company, like you know. But I always wanted that that male influence in my life. And I never really had it, like, you know? Yeah. But on top of male influence, when Jesus came into my life, my life there changed then. Yeah. Because Jesus was a male, obviously, like, you know, like, but the but the disciples all stood out for me, like, because they were all men of great character and women as well, like, you know? And that's the reason why I want to pursue and follow Jesus, because of the strength that they had and the strength they got 
from their faith. Yeah. And my faith there showed me a way of me dealing with the things that I couldn't deal with. Mm. You know, so Jesus, Jesus gave me that strength. He gave me the strength to deal with the things I couldn't deal with, or I thought they were actually weak things. You know, but God works through weakness to actually make you strong. Yeah. I believe anyway. Mm. You know. Do you, so would you say then there was a time of weakness before God? Did you know sort of that, that you were experiencing some kind of weakness before God? Or would you say you were kind of always had this kind of strength? It was just sort of hidden. Well, I noticed when I was young, uh, well, right, right, I, right, I gave my life over when I was 18. <clears throat> and uh, from the day one, I was knocked from that day. I was asked to go to a, to a wee prayer meeting, was the following night. And someone in the meeting asked me, uh, what church did I come from? And I told them what church I come from. And they said, oh, there wasn't much doctor in there. And I was all confused then. Because I thought Christians there were supposed to stick with each other. Hmm. You know, right? And not put each other down. And, uh, uh, like, as I say, being a young Christian, which was only a day old, so it was like more or less like, you know, I, f I found this so strange. But my mother was my backbone. She was the one that gave me the strength when I went home and I said to her, I says, Mom, I says, what do I do here? I says, this person has said this. And she says, you know something? She says, the devil's going to attack you from day one. And she says, that's what's happening. But she says, you know something like, just hold strong. Hold strong and stick to what you're doing. Because God will bring you through it. And I stuck to what I was doing. But of course, as I say, that was the first knock I had. I, 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 I didn't really understand what way to go about it, what way to do it. And I wasn't really guided by anybody. I sort of went to church, what knows, and went to different wee meetings. But there was no big things like I would do now, like I go to a men's group now, I'm very much involved in my church now, and uh, I'm a person now who loves to give back, loves to give to those who need, mm. and that's what God did in my life, he changed me from that weakness that I had to the strength I have now, which is to give back to other people, and like you know every time I went, <coughs> excuse me, every time I went to do something for somebody else, God has blessed me, right? Not because I'm looking at anything back for it, but God has blessed me in such a way where he's, he's given me the strength to go out and do them things. And he's given me more strength. And when I go out and do things for other people, it's a real sense of, I really enjoy this. I really enjoy it because I get a real, a real passion for it then. You know, as I say, I've been to Africa twice, uh, out of the fields of life and out the habitat and it was just that giving back that really I enjoyed that because I knew Jesus had given me so much in my life as bringing me through life without having that male figure in my life so he gave me that strength to stand up and be counted and to do the things that he wanted me to do so as I say basically you know was it uh, I've come from a, a state of life where I grew up with women, which was which was fine, surely, because I didn't know anything else. Uh, I didn't have a male figure in the house, but I really, I enjoyed life to the extent, like you know, it was a, where I needed to get out and be among males. But that was the problem. When I did get among males, you were sort of, you were trying to fall in with a gang more or less, like you we're trying to see that side of it, mm. and. When you were trying to see that side of it, you really didn't want to see it because you didn't want to do the things they were doing. You wanted to walk that fine line but always be on the side of Jesus. And, you know, I've seen it so many times in my life where I've seen maybe my friends going a certain way and I'm going like, no, I can't do that because my conscience does not allow me to do that. And God kept me right that way. So there was no such thing as me going like, you know, something, yeah, full blowing and go and do it like. It was, you know, something like, I'm pulling you back on the, there just with a string like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Well, would you say, um, 
So that this is your younger years. Yeah. Sorry? So this is all your younger years. Yeah. yeah. So what is what what led you to become a Christian at eighteen? <clears throat> well, I worked in a I worked in a baking factory. I was actually a joiner by trade and when I came out of my trade I went to different companies and from day one when I went to different companies I got let down by right? I got let down by people. I was either paid off or somebody had done something on me or to betray me or sorry, right? uh, to betray me like I was actually a friend who did betray me in one of the jobs I was in like and uh, I was told to put a lock on the door and he went and said no no he says you put it in this door and you know like but that's life in general like but I worked in a baking factory <clears throat> and there was a guy there and he was a Christian, very devout Christian and he was always making jokes and laughs and all like and I always went, I always seemed to be drawn towards him and to have a chat with him and talk with him and I went over to him one day and he was sort of coming out with all these silly noises out of his mouth and all he was right, just a comic he was more or less like but he always talked about Jesus and uh, it just there was like water if it looks back to me then. So as I was walking away, <clears throat> he says to me, he says, do you fancy going to a meeting tonight? And I went, I stopped and I looked at him and I went, no. But as soon as I walked on, I was stopped in my tracks and I turned around and went, I will go with you. Yeah. And so that's how I become a Christian. I went to a meeting and in that meeting, the guy was giving his testimony and I just felt drawn to the front. I was told, right, we were all told to go to the front if you want to go to the front, if you want to give your life over. And I knew there and then, the tears just would not stop flowing. And I got to the front and I was taken to the back. I was prayed for and I gave my life over. And as I say, everything just changed from that point onwards. Yeah. You know. And so, you go. And so it was a direct influence then of somebody who you knew and who you just spent a lot of time with at your work and stuff. I suppose that's, that's a powerful message for obviously our listeners who are at work at the minute or mm -hmm. who, um, cause here we have Carl who became, who was saved because of direct influence. It was God obviously working through that person. And I suppose that encourages us to do the same because there could be other Carls in the places where we work, yeah, exactly. you know? Um, but uh, yeah, how do we uh, question here? So um, yeah, the purpose of this podcast is to obviously make people sit down and think about the uh, topics to bring up. Do you recall any moments where you had to really sit down and think and wrestle with something like a great obstacle? And um, if you did, how did you overcome it? Or if you haven't overcome it, what are the methods you're using to try and cope with it? So any challenges that you really had to sit down and think about as a Christian or otherwise? Well, when you're a Christian, you give your life completely over. You don't go half measures. You either go all in, or you don't. There's no such thing as sitting on the fence. You can't be hot and cold. You either have to be, or sorry, sorry, right? You can't be lukewarm and cold. You have to be hot all the time. And when I say hot all the time, you have to be fired up all the time. You have to be ready for the unexpected. And God prepared me for things like that because, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in my younger years, believe it or not, I had the worst stammer in the world and I couldn't have got two words out. And uh, my mom took me to speech therapy and me and my mom just used to laugh and I used to be rolling around the floor laughing at what I had to do to try and get my speech back. And I said to my mom, this is not working. I'm quitting. I'm not work right, not working. And it was only when uh, my mother and me went on a trip out to Israel that I got the courage up. I asked one of the ministers, there were two ministers on the trip, I asked one of them and I says, can I do a reading here? Because I felt so passionate about where I was at. I felt so drawn to where I was at. And what the feeling was, I'm walking on the same ground that our Lord and Jesus Christ walked on. How amazing is that? And I asked the minister, can I do a reading? And he turned around and he said, I'll find out for you. And he came back and he says, he says, Carl, I'm sorry, but all the space has been taken up. And I looked up and I went, Lord, why did you not let me there do a reading in your homeland? Why? And that's the way I left it. 
And when I landed home, we were sitting in church about three weeks later, and this guy walked down by me, and he walked down by me, and he stopped, and he got back, and he says, God, would you do a reading in church next Sunday? Now, this guy never stopped with me, never asked me to do readings or anything. And I went, uh, I was about to stammer, and I went, and I thought about it, and I said, you know something? I asked for this. I asked for this, but it's not my timing. It's God's timing. And I started to develop to know then that you don't do the things on your own. You wait for God to give you a sign to say, you know something like, I'm in control here, not you. And that was the first point in my life that I realized that God was taking control of my life because he showed me. So, of course, I said, yeah, no worries. I'll do the reading. Went to the front of the church the following Sunday. Now, if I had it at the guitar, I think I'd have been Elvis Presley because my legs were shaking. Like, but yeah. my voice, right, but my voice just flowed out. And it wasn't until about maybe five, six years later that I started to, uh, right, my stamina was still there. It was very much there. And it seemed to be getting worse. And I was getting very frustrated with it. And I prayed. And I prayed and I asked God there for, for his help to give me a voice. And I used to write wee poems and I'd have been writing writing poems about my mother and God was always in it and I was writing poems about how I felt trapped, how I felt chained and uh, it was just one of the moments that me and a friend used to go and play snooker and we'd like a board it after a while and then we started talking in a funny voice there to each other and I suddenly realised that when I was talking in this funny voice I wasn't stammering but I had prayed for God to give me an answer so God was giving me an answer and I didn't realise it was coming from God. I thought it was me there doing all this. Like, So I went back to the, the privacy of my own bedroom and started talking in this silly wee voice. And this silly wee voice brought me out of what I was in. I was trapped in a situation where I lost all confidence. I lost all... I, I, I lost everything that I had to try and try and keep me strong. Except the faith of Jesus. Jesus was there always in the background with me. And he was the one that was actually guiding me through everything I was going through. And it was in wee bits and pieces. Give me a voice back. Uh, answer me a prayer. Why did I not there be allowed to do that reading? But it's his timing. Everything's done in his timing. Not yours. That's very challenging for people i mean it's very challenging for myself to hear um like you know i've i have responsibilities and things like that you know i've got rent to pay mm -hmm. bills to pay and stuff like that um work as well and they're doing all that kind of stuff and it's very much time 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 for me yeah. it's very much like i don't like being dependent i have to be independent even though i'm not very good at it it's sort of a piece inside of me that says yeah. be independent don't 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 depend on anybody else let them depend on you so I have that kind of twisted kind of mentality of I want to help people, but from a position where like I, I I'm seen as I guess I'm seen to help people like um sort of like how I don't know I kind of want to build myself up yeah, and so I'm comfortable enough yeah. to help other people, yeah. which is like it's 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 kind of strange to say that out loud, but a lot of people feel like um well how can I help this person when I don't have myself sorted. And they sort of have this kind of thing and it's just about kind of um leaning back on jesus and understanding mm -hmm. that everything exactly. is in his timing and stuff yeah. um but i find that difficult and you know i find that very difficult to try and lean back on something that i'm i feel so strongly about but it's kind of like like he he's real he's as real as the wind as anything like you know mm -hmm. but sometimes it feels like you know getting up for work or you know uh like having to pay them at the monthly rent or stuff mm -hmm. it just seems sort of a little bit more real yeah. and it kind of like takes up my kind of mentality yeah. so my question is then how what made you ultimately fall back and recognize that god is in control god's time and god this god that because when i say oh it's in god's hands it's in god's control it sounds like an excuse and i really don't want it to be well I think I think in certain certain aspects of my life, 
you see distinctly God in control. You don't see, like you can't see God in control in everything because our minds don't allow us there to see everything. But it's those certain times that, for example, there, if you're, as you're talking there about paying your rent, paying your things, and you have to take responsibility and what knows, we all have responsibility in this life. And our responsibility is to people that we love, people that we see who need things and so on. You know, and it, it, in my life, was it, uh, as I say, in their one instance, was it I was applying for a job and I went, I was actually there raising money there to go to Africa, out with fields of life. And every time I was trying to raise money, no money was coming in. I had to raise something like 1800 pound in five, uh, that was five weeks. And over a period of those five weeks, I raised 2300. And every place I went to, to, to help to raise money, the people didn't turn up there to help me. But God provided. And that's why I know God's real. Because when you don't see them situations or where the things come from, but they appear, it's like, there's like the five loaves and the two fishes. I mean, like, God will provide. And he has provided. Mm -hmm. And he's always provided for me. And as I say, this instance, I had applied for this job and applied a number of times. And I went through that a few, I wasn't working and I didn't get it. And I seen it online and I went and applied for it again. I said, you're not going to get away this time. I'm going to go for this job this time again. Like, so I applied for it. And the girl knew me there by name. And she says, girl, don't you bring an application for me? Right, we'll just pull one out of the drawer. Um, we'll look at that and see what they're doing different. I was going to Africa there at that time. I was with my, uh, their wife-to-be at that time. And she turned around and she said to me, she says, girl, you need this job. You have to quit Africa. You can't be going to Africa because you'll not get this job. They'll not give it to you. And I went, right. And in my heart, I says, no. No, this is what God wants me to do. And this is what I'm doing. This is God's work. I don't give up on God's work. When God asks you there to do something, you follow it through. Because if you do not follow it through, you'll see the consequences of it. Because that's what God wants. Whatever God wants, God will actually bring it to the forefront. God is not, right, God can be a God of wrath. He can be a God of loving, which he is. But when he tells you to do something, you do it. You don't sit back and go, you know something, I'll think about that. Because to me, that's like an armchair Christian. I'm not an armchair Christian. I'm a Christian who wants to be involved, who wants to do things. And when I went for the job, I took the paperwork up with me for me going to Africa. I didn't let me their wife there to be there and all this like and I got up anyway and uh turned around and uh, she pulled out the application for me and she says here's what are you doing? I said nothing different compared to, right, nothing different from what you have in that form. And I says, But I'm going out to Africa. And there was five people in that room and they all sat up in the chair and they went, Oh, and what are you going out there there to do? I says, Well, I'm going out there to help build schools there. I've gone out there into what they call the killing fields out in Uganda. And they turned around and they says, and they were, they were very interested in what I was doing then. So in my heart of hearts, that was more important to me going to Africa to give back than it was me even getting the job. Like, But I knew God was in control. And I knew God would not let me down because I was doing what he wanted me to do. God will provide. So when you think to yourself, if you have something planned to do for God, when you're doing something for somebody else, you're doing what God wants you to do. You're giving back. Because God told us, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So when you give back to people, God will, you know, right, God will provide for you. Because he's told you that. I will give to you as you give back to our people. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the girl says to me, she says, Carl, we will let you know uh, on Monday what the situation is. But it looked more positive. Come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and there was no sign, no letter, no nothing. I was going to visit my mother and a letter fell through my mother's letterbox. And I opened it up and it says, we're very pleased to say that you've got the job. 
and I jumped for joy and I rung there was up my wife to be as I say and I says and I've got the job and I says and I'm going to Africa and she says don't you come home until I calm down and I, I says well, what have I done what have I done but my wife uh, I, my wife there was married for the second time and uh, their last husband there told her lies and she couldn't take lies and so on like but to me I wasn't telling a lie to me that wasn't a lie that was the truth because God wants you to tell nothing but the truth and the truth was I'm doing this for you I'm not going there to say you know something like I want this job more than I want what God wants for me so whatever you have going on in your life it's not as important as what God wants you to do. So whatever God wants you to do, put the other things in the back burner and do them because God will bring them things along with it. And has done in many things in my life. And as I say, like, you know, is it the, don't, don't ever take that step out without having Jesus with you. Always call the Holy Spirit before you do anything. The Holy Spirit has been left here for a reason. And the reason why he's been left here is for our contact. To make that contact between Jesus and you. I never do anything unless I call the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God and I sort of there. God three in one. And there's a reason behind the three of them. You know, and there's even Christians out there, there today who don't even realise are right don't understand right why there's god the father and the son and they're so important for what they did do so as i'm saying now whatever you have going on in your life make sure that god's involved in it because if god's not involved in it you're doing it yourself and if you're doing it yourself you're going to fall because it'll not work out the way you want it to work out. I noticed this a long time ago when I was in my twenties. I said to myself, for example, if I was planning the holiday, I said, I can't plan nothing. Because it's God's timing. It's not my timing. I have planned things in the past and they don't work. Because when it comes to the time to do it, everything changes. But when God's in control, it doesn't change. Because God has a plan. You just have to let him take control and go with it. Mm. Uh, very good. Um, I've got another question here. Um, were there any shaggy moments in your Christian faith? And how did they lead you to where you are now? Any shaky moments? There's been quite a few. <laughs> so I was like, you know... Uh, I think one of the biggest, well, when you talk about shaky moments, like, I think one of the biggest shaky moments in my life would be the likes of patience. Patience, there was a big, big problem for me. Because, because if I had a stammer, I was always on edge to try and get words out. So I never had the patience to hold back from that. And that, that come with me later on in life as well. That kept, that kept their nudging at me. When somebody was going to want me to do something, I had the patience to wait. I had to go and do it. And it got to the point in my life where I seemed to be out of control because I was trying to take control. And I had asked God, I says, Lord, I says, give me the patience to understand what you want me to do, not what I think I need to be doing. And they were really shaky moments for me, like, and there'd been other moments like you know, where, uh, gosh, uh, you know, just different, you know, just different things in life that come along in general, you know. But I seem to find there that people seem to come to me with problems, and I used to say to myself, "Who's the one that's shaking here the most? Is it them or me?" You know, because God was always always got a hold of me and but the biggest problem I had was the patience because every time I was speaking 
people try to finish my sentences because I couldn't have got the words out. And that's where my patience lacked then. I started to get frustrated with that. And that continued on into my life once I got my voice back. It was patience. But God soon learnt me. Be patient and with me. And that happened, as I say, that happened one night in a prayer meeting. We were in a prayer meeting and I cried like a baby there for the full hour. And come the following Tuesday night, same thing happened again. And I cried like a baby, but I cried harder and harder. And I went up to the front of the church to get down my knees and I prayed. And a woman came up and put her hand on my head and she says, Carl, God knows what you're looking. And I come back down into my pew. And uh, the last prayer was, I says, Lord, I need to know you. I need to feel you. I need to see you. And that was all down through the patience. Because I wasn't getting enough of them. I felt anyway. And I opened my Bible up. It fell open. At Psalm 37. And it talked about wicked men. They will fade away like green grass. And I didn't understand these things. Until I got down to verse 7. It says be patient and wait in the Lord. And I said Lord. You're talking to me now aren't you? You're telling me. When I've asked to see you. You're telling me. Slow down. Wait. I just say when I. So the very next day. I uh, got my earphones in. Went for a walk. And I was walking up the road and this song come on and the tears started to trip me again. And I looked up and I says, Lord, I says, what's going on now? I says, why am I crying again for? What are you doing to me? And just as that there, I felt my two arms being pushed into the ISA to me. And as I looked down, I seen a set of hands coming around me. As quick as they come, they disappear. And... The yeah, next thing I felt my right arm being lifted up. I never lifted up my shoulder. It just went on his own accord up. And I goes. And I looked up and I seen a hand coming into it. And I wasn't shocked or startled by it. And my hand fell down. I followed my hand down. I fell down my side. And I lifted my head up to walk forward. And I seen a face coming towards me with the white shroud on it. And it come as quick as it went. And I felt as if I was in a bubble. Because there was no cars, there was nobody on the road, there was no nothing. God picks his time for you and him. He gives you the time to be, to be ready for him to approach you. God had asked, or sorry, God told me to be patient. So I said, right, I'm going to be patient. And it was the next day that, that God didn't hold back. He showed me who he was. And uh, I rung the guy who took the meeting. I says, Phil, can I have a word with you? And he says to me, well, what's wrong? I says, I'm not going to tell you on the phone because you probably think I'm nuts. So we landed around to the house and I told him and he started to cry. And I says, what are you crying at now? I said, I've done enough crying there for everybody. He says, I've been praying there for the last two Tuesday nights that you get to see Jesus. And he says, you've had a vision. He says, not too many people have it. And I go, wow. And that was the start of Everything that started to take off. I felt God really deeply, a real big deep presence in me. And then things started to take off in my life. You know, and that's just the way it was. You know, but God, God is more and more and more in my life now. And I want more. Whatever God wants me to do, I'll do it. I'm not afraid of it. Because that's our end goal. Is to be with him in his presence. Our end goal is not to turn around and say, I want this, I want to get more of that, I want more of the other. Because they fade away. They don't last. When you're talking about paying your rent, that's a necessity. Mm -hmm. There are things you have to work towards to keep yourself like a roof over your head. But the Lord provides. He provides the work for you. He provides a constant job for you. If that job was to fail, God will have something else around the corner for you. You just have to let him take control. And what I took out of that experience walking up that road was when I turned around and uh, those three incidents when I seen the hands coming around me and I thought about it afterwards and then I seen me hand with a hand coming into it and then when I looked forward and I seen the face God was telling me I've got a hold of you. 
They want to realize that his hand went to my hand. He says, let me lead you. Let me take you by the hand. Let me show you. And then he showed me who he was. And that was Jesus. And from that point to now, I tell that story all the time because it's really deep rooted within me. That's a big part of my life. God is a big part of my life and always will be. Amazing, yeah. I would... I would like to say something here because I've had in uh, my life a similar kind of experience. Okay. Um, I'm not talking about this before on the podcast, I think, uh, but um, I was very low. I was about 15. I was very, very low in who I was. Didn't really want to be me anymore. And uh, my family would often go and teach English and stuff in Romania and Hungary and Ukraine and stuff like that. And there was this beautiful forest. And in the middle of the night, we always we always have like this big bonfire before we all go to bed. And I thought I'd just leave and go for a walk in the forest because I, I just felt I, I just read um, Across the Switchblade. Um, uh, it's a very good book. I recommend uh, listeners read it. Um, and I just sort of broke down into tears in the forest because I know I could really say it was comfort me because I just needed that kind of warmth and that comfort. Mm -hmm. And it was like this battle in my head between what I can really describe as um, good and evil, God and Satan. And I, I was as clear as the day. It was in the middle of the night and it was bright inside my, at least inside my head, where there was all of my sin on one side. Then it just looked so small and so manageable. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side was just this presence Mm -hmm. and you know it was it was warm and it was and it, and it spoke to me and it said i've been comforting you since day one mm -hmm. you are only just saying now and i i was just and i i, I was i was there for three hours um people started getting worried for me when i came back home they were like well ben where were you and i was just like i'm just gonna go to bed i'm really tired right but i need to speak to someone about that yeah i really needed to speak to someone about that and so a few months later when we got home and my minister at the time, um, my old church, um, I sat down with him mm -hmm. and I told him about it. And essentially, he laughed at me. Oh. He, he essentially went, God only reveals himself through his word. And he said to me, you know, we're probably just emotional. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I was emotional. But he said to me, I wouldn't really think anything of that, Ben. And that really, that really cut deep for me. It really cut deep because it was in a period of my life where I didn't think life was worth living. Yeah. And then I had this sign mm -hmm. to say, there's big plans for you, mate, you know? And I, I just, and I, I, I just longed for that kind of unity that obviously yeah. um, well, that guy Phil had with you. But from that day forward, there was a bunch of other drama that happened like yeah. in that, in that church, but from that day forward, I just had this really unshaky feeling of where I was. Yeah. Like, because I was like, these people are all Christians, but they don't, they're not taking a moment. They're not taking a chance to listen to what I yeah. am saying. Um, what's that passage in Job that we opened up with in the, like our first podcast episode? It was basically a young guy saying to the elders, um you know listen to me just because i am younger does not mean yep. i have nothing to say um forget I forget what words that's in a joke but it really stood out to me because mm -hmm. there was none of that yeah. i don't feel my voice was being heard at all and so when you have this kind of like building the skyscraper in your head where you're climbing the stairs every day just to go all the way back down again to try and bring somebody up with you um when you, you find when you say no nah, we're going to get to the top we're going to get to the top it's just a few floors up they let go of my hand and i go back down the stairs again that's yeah. what it feels like it's all that effort all that energy trying to bring people to, to see the views that i've seen yeah. to feel how i feel and that's one of the reasons why i love this podcast because i get that i can express yeah, that exactly. you know how how then can i get that back how can i rely entirely on god when any person who i've tried to lead 
any person who have tried to see what I've seen or to feel how I feel or to just be just to know Jesus because I've had so many conversations with so many of my friends about it but every single one of them has it just go back down the stairs again mm-hmm. and I feel helpless what what, 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 what can I do oh, well, don't worry about it sorry about that No, uh, you mean they're how to get through to your friends? You mean how? Do I, it's, you... I, I'm I'm very good at getting through to people. <laughs> like I'm 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 good at talking. It's how do I how do I maintain that level of faith to the God throughout the feelings that I've had? Like I feel like I fail every time. Yep. Uh, where how do i where do i draw my faith from what do i see as i say when we talk about the three and one there's a lot of people who do not understand the three and one they don't understand the reason why there's three and one you know as i say like you know was it we have god the father who's the who's the creator of this earth right he's created everything we have the son who we sent down as as god as the one as in human form and he come down to prove you know you're made in my image i'm pure i have no sin but you can be with me by doing the same thing what i do you do and when jesus left this earth he didn't leave us there just hanging he says there'll be somebody coming after me and people don't realize that the holy spirit's a person he's not just a like sort of an entity he's a person and the holy spirit is here for us to use he's everything he's the healer he's the mediator he's the teacher people don't realize that we should use the holy spirit to what he's there for and that's why i said at the start of this podcast the Holy Spirit is so important to call for everything. When you're looking to be, when you're looking to be, uh, in certain situations, you'll have a, a feeling come over you, which will be like, you know, right, right, just whatever that situation is, you'll know it yourself when you come along. Like, for example, your friends are, and you feel as if there's somebody saying something to you, right, right. For example, a friend saying something to you and this thing's going through your head going, you know something? No, I, I need to try and change this person's mind here. Like, You don't try to do it yourself because you can't do it yourself. You need help. And the help you need is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to be used. He wants to be used. He wants you to use him. You don't sit back and go like, right, what can I do? Because it's not about you. It's about what God gives you to use. If you turn around and you go, you know, something like, I'm going to talk to this person here. I'm going to convince them that God's real. Look at me. Right? He's real. Look what he's done in my life. That person hasn't experienced what you've experienced in your life. And how I get through to people is I tell people about the experiences I've had in my life. Now, I've had quite a few, as I say, like, you know, I'm not I, I, I'm not a saint uh, sort of very far from it like but what I want is I want more of what Jesus can give me and the secret is to let Jesus take control as I say again if you come across situations it only takes a split second for a prayer to go straight up to God but you call the Holy Spirit before you say that prayer because the Holy Spirit will keep that prayer protected you don't call the Holy Spirit, that prayer's not protected. It just goes into the air. The Holy Spirit's here to be used for everything. And when you come across a situation like that where you want to reach somebody, call the Holy Spirit to open that situation up to you. It's like you open the Bible there, for example. I call the Holy Spirit every time I open the Bible. Lord, open your word. Let your word jump out at me. Let your word come alive before me. 
And you see, when you do that, you start to realize that what I'm reading makes sense to me. Before, because all, right, I'm reading my Bible morning and night, and before I struggled with reading, I was never a reader. Never was. But the Bible's so important to me to read. So important. And I would say one verse which stands out for me, and it stood out for me there over this whole lockdown. And I told my aunt about this. Uh, there's Psalm 91, and she's went and told hundreds of people. And people have stopped me and said, you know something, your aunt's give me their Psalm 91 to read. And you know some, it's a big, you know something, it's a big part of my life now, like, right? It really tells me all what to do and keep myself right and so on. So you see, the words there are to be used, but the Holy Spirit is there for you to use him to open these things for you. And it's the same thing in situations in your life. The Holy Spirit is there for you to use him. You're only losing out if you don't. Because if you don't use the things that God has told you to use, you're the one that's going to lose. The Israelites didn't listen to God when they left Egypt. They were so impatient. They were so fed up. Have you brought us out there into the desert there to kill us? They didn't see what God was doing. They didn't see through the smoke. They only seen... Like, right, the reason why Jesus... Or, sorry... Right, the reason why God took the Israelites there was through the desert there for 40 years because he knew it was going to take 40 years there for them to understand. And even then, at the end of the 40 years, they didn't understand. They still wanted more. And that's why God says, I'm not going to the promised land. Me, There's the promised land of Moses you're not going to know because of what you've done. You went against me by not believing in me. You pleaded for them on their behalf when you knew I was in control. And it's all about control. God's in control. Not you. So when I'm saying, when you come across situations like that, you call the Holy Spirit. And you make sure that he's at the forefront of that. It's the same as you go to pray. When you pray, you don't pray just a prayer like that. You call the Holy Spirit and you let him take control. Now, as I say, uh, it, I look down to the likes of their say. Uh, say uh, there's an Anne's Cathedral every Monday night now I don't know if it's back on you or not but I go through there for a healing service every Monday night and the first thing they would do is <coughs> excuse me they spend two minutes there in silence calling the Holy Spirit why? because the Holy Spirit is in control that's God that's God left here for you so Use the facilities what God's give you. Don't sit back and go, you know, something like... Because when you start praying and you don't call the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? You're doing it yourself. You're trying to do it yourself. It's not going to happen. Because what you're looking at, you're looking... You're looking to be sort of... Uh, what's the word for it? You're looking to get the praise for it. You always give... right. You always let Jesus have the praise, the glory and the honour. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father are all one. Jesus done his job. Jesus come to this earth to prove to you that I'm here in, in human form. Why did God not send down something else? Like, right, I've said this there, Richard is like, why did God not send down a horse? Made a horse he would talk, or an animal or something. Why did he send down somebody who looks like us? Because he's telling you, you know something, I love you. I want to let you know. This is me. I'm the same as you. Look in the mirror. And you'll see the same. I have two arms, two legs. But I don't sin. I'm perfect. Do you want to be where I'm going to be? And you follow me. And when you follow Jesus, you follow everything he's given you. And the Holy Spirit is what you follow. So you call the Holy Spirit before you do anything. And it was your man, Phil, who was during that time I told him there about what I had. He was the one that told me that. He says, you never pray unless you call the Holy Spirit. You never do anything unless you have a backup. And your backup is the Holy Spirit. When you call the Holy Spirit, Satan can't get at you. What you've had has been an experience 
you were at a time of your life where, where it was low. But God was letting you know that I'm in control. Leave it to me and I'll bring you through that. If you don't, if you don't leave it to me, how can I lead you when you won't follow? It's the same thing as the Israelites. If you don't listen to what somebody tells you and you go and do it yourself, what do you do when it goes wrong? I should listen to you. It's happened to me so many times in my life with my mother, for example. All mothers know best. You turn around and say, you know, something like, I'm going to give you a word of advice and you're going to go, well, oh, here we go again. Like. But that word of advice is a very important word because they have lived life. You haven't. And uh, you know, some, sometimes a young head on old shoulders, it's a dangerous thing because they think they know it all and they keep stepping out and doing their own thing. So as I say, you're talking now about situations in your life. Let the Holy Spirit take control. Don't you be in control. Just sit back. You've done to do. Sit back and let him guide you. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a note down here. I want to see what you think about it because um, I think modern Christianity, at least in the West, right? So Christianity, as we experience it anyway, is um, this is a, this a rejection of the idea of like mysticism, that kind of thing, as in God without the miracles, God without this spirit stuff. I mean, have all this doctrine, that's fine, it all makes sense, but there's no way it really happens like that, surely. You know, there's this side, you understand what I mean? No, it just... It's like, um, as I say, your, your uh, minister, you say, um, oh, he, he doesn't work like that anymore. Hmm? That, was, that was past. It's not like that now. You know, it's just, we've got... Do you, do you understand? Yeah, 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 so you're talking about uh, Christianity in a spiritual sense. Like, um, people, modern Christianity says that is outdated and there's a particular way to to serve God, to worship God, to attend church, and it's A, B, and C, not one, two, three, as it was. Um, whereas I would say, you know, look at the early church, look at Paul's letters and the examples that he constantly has with the churches. You know, and my question is, are we so different to the people who he's writing to? Do you know what I mean, Carl? Yeah. So, like, God without mer the miracles. Yeah. yeah. What, do you agree with that, with that statement? I think we've lost our way. Very much so. I think when you talk about the, you know, the letters there that, that Paul wrote to the different churches, like, you know, was it... He was telling them what they were doing wrong. Mm. He was telling them what they needed to do there to change. And we've actually went from from that time to slowly and surely doing our own thing. And you can see that day by day, every day. The, the, this world is out of control. And it's out of control because we're not in control. But we think we are. And it all goes back to the same thing again. We're not letting God take control. We have allowed ourselves to have that freedom of control. And that's a self-destruct mode. And that's what this world's on, is a self-destruct mode. People people say, you know, so Mikey, you know, so Mikey, I'm with there until we hear this lockdown and we get this all sorted out again. This is not over. By far, this is not over. This is God, to me, this is God's wrath. This is God's wrath coming upon the world. God tells us in Revelation, like, you know, is it, that will be earthquakes, that will be this, that, and the other. These things are all coming to pass. But it'll also get to a point, and we're not far away from it, where people are not going to be allowed to know what God's doing anymore. They're not going to be involved in it. Because God's going to blind them to it. He's going to deafen them to it. They're not going to know the word anymore. And the other ones are going to be completely lost. And we're not going to be fit to reach them. Because their class is unreachable. Because they don't want to reach. They don't want to give up the things they're doing, which is the sinful nature of the flesh. Or the sinful nature of, I can't get enough. 
these things will fade away. There's nothing on this earth will not die. Everything rots. Our bodies rot. Timber rots. Everything, everything just fades. If you leave something there land like an electrical thing there for years, the dust will destroy it. Same as anything. If you want to hold on to something that's going to fade away, it's not going to work. You must hold on to something that you've got a future with. And the only thing you've got a future with is Jesus. Jesus come here. Jesus come here to give his life up. If you could tell me that your best friend would give his life up for you, that would be, be an extraordinary story. Because does that friend there not, not have a life of theirs to live? They not have a family? What did Jesus do? Jesus come to this earth to prove to you, I want a day for you. So I love you that much that I want you to be with me. Because where I am, I want you to be there as well. God is so passionate. He's so full of love. He's so full of kindness. He wants to give you everything of your desire. And he will if you give your life to him. If you don't give your life to him, you can't expect to get something out of life if you don't put it in. It doesn't happen. If you put if you put uh, if you put a five pound of petrol into your car, you'll get five pounds worth of travelling on that five pound. If you don't put it in, you can't move. It's the same thing with God. Whatever you put into this life, like feeding our people there what you have been through, feeding our people there with what God can do for you, how wonderful God is. People are blinded by what they see out there. Because all they see is greed. All they see is the person driving up the road in a flash car. Oh, I want that. It's an evil world we live in. It's a fallen world we live in. I was reading a book there recently. It was called The Book of Revelation in layman's terms. And it says we are now living in Noah's times. You can see it. In Noah's times, they talk about, in the book of Noah, they talk about, is it, people were still marrying. People were still doing this. They were still partying. They were still doing this, that and other. And in that book of Revelation, it talked about the same thing. Everything that's going on now was happening back then. And we're at that stage now. What did God do? God showed his wrath. Because he destroyed the world. He said he never destroyed it again. But what he will do is, he closed the ears and he closed the eyes of people. So they'll not hear and they'll not see. And that's every bit as good as being drowned it. Because you're not going to be, you're not going to be given that, given that heavenly position, given that, that mansion that God has wanted to prepare for you. Where I go, I prepare a place for you. In my house, there's many mansions. People turn around and say, you know, something like, I don't have the things that I really want. But you do. You just have to ask for them. If you don't ask for them, you can expect to get. If you give something, or if you don't give something to somebody, you can expect to get back. What you put in it is what you get out. Life should be given, not taken. When you give, you don't hold on to it. Because it's going to fade away. Give it to somebody who needs it at that time. That's why we should all be, we should all, right, we should all be encouraging each other. We should all be telling people. I, I'll tell you one story, was it, I, I was over the graveyard one day, I was seeing my wife's grave, God love her. And there was a lady there who I used to work with. There was an Asda, right, she was a cleaner. And I had been talking to her more times than enough about God and trying to tell her, oh, she needs to change her ways and give her life over. And we're up the graveyard and I met her and I said, well, have you made that their decision yet? Have you given your life over? And she went, how come God? I says, hold on a second. I says, God didn't put anybody here. I says, get that out of your head. I says, God, give us life. God didn't give us life there to take life from us. I says, Adam and Eve took that from us. When they done what God didn't want them to do. We live in a fallen world. And that's why we do the things we do. But God gave us a chance. Because he sent his son down here to prove, I love you that much. I've come back for you. 
I'm down here now to give my life up so I can take all your sins away. So what do you want? Do you want to live a life of of having the things that you want? Can you take them with you? If a man is twenty pound or a man has got twenty million, they're both gonna get the same depth of a hole in the ground, which is six foot. That twenty million doesn't count. That twenty pound doesn't count. But they both got the same. There's no different. What you have, if you've got twenty million in the bank, don't hold on to it. Use it for the good things. Use it to help people to come along, to realise that what people see in you, God's working through you. If God's working through you, people see that and they want what you have. I used to work in Asda as a baker. I was there for five years. There was a guy on down there and he done nothing but curse all the time and what knows. And me and him were in the back of the place and we were sort of there getting. They're sort of prepping the stuff there for the next morning and, uh, and making bread and what knows. And we both had our backs turned to each other. And out of the blue, he says to me, he says, You know something? He says, uh, I get money out of two wee girls out in Africa. He says, Do you? He says, I do. I says, That's God working through you. I says, God's give you that. He's give you that spirit there to do that. He says, Do you think so? I says, I says, why did you do that yourself? I says, did you wake up one day and go like, you know, so am I going to give those out there? He says, that thought how he put there. I says, God put that thought there. He says, do you mind if I pray with you? He says to me, no, not at all. So I stood in the prayer room and he cried. And I gave him a hug. And he thanked me up and down. And that space of us talking... Nobody ever come round the back and they come round the back the whole time to get stuff and bring it around the front of the shop. God has his moment. God has his time for everything. The next day I come on to work. Somebody says to me, hey, what's wrong with the brand? I says, why, what's wrong with him? He says, he's been all nice to us. Not cursing. Not saying anything wrong. I says, that's not wrong. He says, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And when I turned around and before I left, or sorry, when I left Asda, I always talked to people there about God, even the customers. I, I just had a friendly word with them about God, like I'm witness. And when I left, somebody came down and looked at me. And the fellow approached them and says to them, says, it's Jar Blackwell here. Uh, and they go, no, he's left. He says, by the way, he says, is that the fellow who always talked about God? So you leave a legacy. So you leave something that triggers something in somebody's head. They go like, he was a man of faith. You know, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Not because I've said that, but when people recognise who you are, what you are, that's what you're standing for. Yeah, my in our yearbook, I was voted most likely to become a priest. <laughs> 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 you know, that's my legacy, but um, that's one of the reasons why I miss school so much is because... You know, with all my friends, everybody, every, everybody knew I was a Christian. Yeah, everybody knew that I would never back down mm -hmm. when questioned about it, and everybody, right. you know. But in this new life of you know finding my own feet and doing stuff, it's it's very hard to try and get that back again. But as you say, God's timing. It's God's timing. Yeah, and you know something like, uh, I tell you what, I miss the most. I miss my wife. My wife passed away four years ago. She died of cancer. And I know her right through to the very end. And we were together 13 years. We were only married for six. And someone says, oh, you just didn't get long. And, and what do you say to that? Like, you know, I want a lifetime, but it wasn't my, wasn't my call. As I say, I go to a men's group meeting. Well, they did. I'm right. They wasn't working. I'm not fit to get to it. Like, but why is keeping contact with him? Not this one particular one tonight. And uh, there seemed to be this guy Phil who was always involved in these things with me. Like, and I want this one tonight. And I come home and I seen God do one whole thing on it. And I come in and I, I, and I said to my wife, I says, I was telling her all about these things that God had done, and she says, "Carl, you stop talking about God because you do my head on." <laughs> so I rung him up again. I said, "Look, I just said." Right, I, I, I think I'm a little bit of a problem here. I, I think I'm just walking my own. 
He said, where are you from? So I told him, on the following Wednesday night, after the meeting, he brought me home and he prayed me out in the car and he says, now you go in there, give your wife a big kiss, tell you love her, don't mention God no more. Walk upstairs and, and get down your knees and tell him where to take over life. Now this is where it goes sort of, well, power shaped there in my life anymore. And I was like, you know, was it the following day she found a lump and she went there to get a private diagnosis on the Monday and uh, come back and she was told that it was cancer and we sat on the edge of bed and we cried our eyes out and we didn't know what the future there was going to be but we knew now and I says look and I say I can be here for you 24 7 seven days a week I can kiss you hug you hold you one thing I can't do is I can't heal you I says but I know who can and I says are you ready to give your life over and she says, Aunt. And she gave her life over there and then. And I says, Mom will sit down, or we'll kneel down at the end of the bed, and we'll pray. And I says, Now put your hands out like this. I says, Open yourself up like a gateway. I says, So your hearts open up. And I says, Now we'll call the Holy Spirit. So listen to this bit. This bit's very, very important. So I says, Now we'll call the Holy Spirit. So we call the Holy Spirit, and I. And then I started to pray. I'd no sooner started to pray and she nudged me. And I says, what's wrong? She says, are you touching my hands? I says, I ain't touching. I'm over here. I says, that's the Holy Spirit. I says, the Holy Spirit's now in you. And he wants to live in you. And from being told that, her life drastically changed to be the person that God wanted her to be. And we'd have been in Belfast a few times and, you won't, and she wouldn't have thought twice there of putting a 20 pound note there was under somebody sleeping bag out in the street. She went to the hole in the wall and took money out and I thought she was going to, there by this guy who was sitting next to the hole in the wall was food or something and she went and gave me the ground. I went, ah, I said, what are you Because she's always thinking to herself they're going to buy a drink or drugs or whatever. Like. She says, oh, she says, I have the heart. He has to the conscience. So she was teaching me. She was teaching me that you give from the heart. You don't give to get back. You give from the heart to let people see that Jesus is in you. And Jesus was very much in her from that day that she gave her life over. Her whole life just transformed like out there. And, you know, she was a love of my life. And when she was diagnosed, I said, I asked the Lord, I said to the Lord, right, I, right, I want a six day fast. I fasted for six days. Yeah, you know, so I like my food. I like my food. And this is how I know again that God is really involved in my life at that point and how he's so real. And I done a six day fast and I ate nothing for six days. I drank nothing but water. And every time I prayed, I prayed three times a day in a dark room. And I can clearly tell you now when right but I was praying the tears were tripping me, but they weren't actually just run down my face, they were actually squirting out onto the bed. And after I'd finished praying for an hour, three times a day, I asked the Lord there to heal my wife. And I had to rush my wife into hospital at half two in the morning. She was nearly dead after one, one bout of chemo. Took her down. They wanted to fill her up there full of antibiotics and bring her back up again and then keep on giving her the chemo. And she says, look, she says, are you trying to kill me? I can't take this no more. And that was one bout. So she didn't take it. She took the 10 bouts of radiotherapy. And uh, turned around with it anyway. And she came home anyway. And then we had to go to the hospital. So we, right, so we lived our life out there to the best of our ability. But it came back with ancients three years later. And I come back and ended up there with our liver, lungs and bones. And we went into the hospital. And we always prayed together then after that. I've been reading my Bible at night before my wife there gave her life over and she said to me, here, right, she said to me, here, here, read something to me, will you? And so I had to read something to her, like, and I believe these were things that God was actually doing for me to try and get through to her. But anyway, when she was taken into the hospital that time, we went into the room and they gave her a, like a bag of sodium. They said her sodium there was low. So they gave her a bag of sodium. It didn't hold. And they said, look, we have to ring the scientists here. Are the physicians in the hospital and see what we can do and they said look if if you've got the biggest bag of sodium there put that in to this lady 
and if it holds, that's great. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. We we don't have anything else. And we prayed. And when we prayed, we prayed that this would work. And the sodium held. And but the nurses and the doctors came back in uh, about three or four days later and they said, my wife had high blood pressure. Right? She was diabetic. They turned around and said, you don't have any diabetes anymore. Your sugar levels are perfect. Your blood levels are perfect. Your blood pressure is normal. Never never for a long time was it like. And our sodium levels there were holding. And she was let out of the hospital there was two weeks later. And she says, I want to walk out. And she walked out. She wasn't fit to walk in. Because I wheelchaired her. There. Because she couldn't move her legs. She walked out. So God gave her. Give her grace to do what she wanted to do, which is to walk out. She walked out, and of course, when she got home, she was very tired and different things, you know. Like, but at the end of the day, God did not heal her here, but God healed her to be with Him. And healing to me is temporary, salvation is permanent. If somebody's looking at healing, we're all looking healing of something, maybe something that's wrong with us. I would suggest that anybody out there, when we talk about healing, healing of the body, anything in our lives, everything in our lives all deteriorates, and we want fixed. We want to be made holy in. The only way you can be made holy in is by giving your life over to Christ. When you give your life over to Christ, it doesn't matter if you're healed here. Because when you go to be with him, your life is absolutely perfect. You have no more pain, no more tears, no more fears. So what I'm saying is, through this whole conversation, God's in control. You're not in control. If you want to live your life to the full, give your life over to Christ. Let him do with it as he pleases. Whatever he does with it, it'll be done to their greater glory. Because all the praise, the glory and the honour is his. Amen. Amen is right. Amen indeed. Sounds like a good place to stop it to me. Okay. What do you think? That's fine. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Carl. No problem. That was it was enjoyable. Incredible. I just I just feel that is something we need to be doing now. We need to be getting out there to tell people there, but Jesus, yeah. people, yeah. people are doing it. People are sitting back on their armchair Christians. And God, when you're uh, when you're in front of God, and God says to you, "Well, what did you do in my name?" Well, I gave my life over to you. But what did you do in my name? Well, I get, well, I get, no, 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 no. You know something like you, you didn't do anything. You sat there. I'm thinking of your own salvation. You don't sit there. You do what God asks you to do. Yeah. You use the things he gives you. Yeah. And I think, I think Carl, you're a really good example of someone who you stick your, you stick out there, you know, because every time I say you, you're always, even if you're not talking to me, you're talking to someone else about God, you're asking to kind of pray for you, right? And no doubt yeah. you're praying for them as well when you go back home. Yeah. You know? And no doubt you pray, you ask God to give you these opportunities as well. Yeah, and, he does, and you take the opportunities when they come as well. You know, yeah. and you know, them opportunities outweigh anything you'll ever have. Would you do yourself? Hmm. There's nothing in your life that will match up to what God can yeah. do in your life. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Well. Thank you very much, Carl, no and uh, thank you very much, listeners, uh, for tuning in. Um, please leave a like, uh, definitely subscribe. Uh, we're on pretty much all the platforms, Spotify, YouTube. This is the 24th episode, which means if we've uploaded uh, once a fortnight, that's, that's like a, a year, uh, pretty much. A year of podcasting? Crazy. That is crazy thank you for being with us for a year <laughs> um <laughs> do do make sure to message us on our uh, instagram uh, it's just accessory to thought and um let us know if there's any topics that uh, you want us to talk about 
and also if you want a guest on we're we're happy to take yeah. you on as well thank you for watching Goodbye. listening bye-bye <laughs> bye-bye <laughs>